So, Tere, your your anecdote about TAing for Barbara Fields uh, reminded me of this quote uh, that is actually from one of your articles, Adolf, from uh, TNR. Uh, So I want to read it really quickly and then get both of your responses. You write, one plain rhetorical tick in the world of race reductionist scholarship is the casual referencing of Black American experience across space and time in the first person plural. Although this tendency seems to have become a zealously defended norm in the great awakening, it's hardly new. My son, as a graduate student teacher's assistant in the mid-1990s, would query African-American history students who used we in their seminar papers to refer to slaves and sharecroppers. Were you alive in 1860 or 1880? All right, so Toure, uh, explain your harsh grading. <laughs> um, actually, what I, what I wanted to what I wanted to ask both of you is, um, you know, I, I think we've been talking a little bit about some of the sort of pitfalls or shortcomings of talking about a kind of or invoking a kind of trans historical like black experience, right? Um, I, I wanted to specifically ask you both about um, this idea of a like ongoing and trans historical black liberation struggle or black freedom struggle because I think that we hear that a lot, and you you talk about this a little bit in the Socialist Register piece. Um, and I thought that the quote about uh, Toure's harsh grading was maybe like a good entry point into that. So there, there are no harsh graders in the Ivy League. <laughs> so. <laughs> that, that's exactly right. <laughs> so, um, but I, I will say that to this day, I ask my students some version of that same question. No, um, it's a preemptive. Uh, I think it, I usually do it on the first day uh, and tell them not to use the first person plural. Uh, ever uh, when discussing historical figures. But um, I'll, I will defer to the boomer read uh, and I'll, I will, uh, as the Gen Xer would, follow him. <laughs> well, I'll say this too. Like it wasn't just that he was um, you know, like that with, uh, with those students, but I remember like he was also um, TAing during the period when uh, you know, Columbia was setting uh, the NCAA record for consecutive <laughs> football losses. And then he would say things to the students like, look, you better pass this course if you want to get that Wall Street job, because clearly there's no NFL in your future. Right. Uh, and, and things like that, uh, you know, but others as well. Uh, yeah, I mean. So, uh, um, yeah, like I grew up with uh, with uh, the black freedom movement, the black liberation struggle, right? Uh, during the transition out of black power in, in, into the different, you know, prefab uh, ideological orientations that replaced it, that Cedric Johnson's first, first, first book is a great examination of, um, you, you could see then that part of the narrative for the new ideology was, was like with a chemistry textbook, that what you do is you redefine or rather you reinterpret the history, all prior existing history of black life uh, as a story of the inevitable un- unfolding toward what, whatever this new position is, right? And it, it's, but I mean, like I said, it's like chemistry texts. Um, but so that, what I remember being in a conference uh, you know, at, at the kickoff of Pan-Africanism where some, some guy was talking about how the first Pan-Africanist was the first woman on a slave ship who threw her baby uh, on overboard to drown because she didn't want to see it become a slave, right? The problem is that the notion of a black, of, of, of a um, trans-historical black freedom movement, right? Uh, first of all, is a colossal historical, what I'm reification. Right. I mean, it it suggests, you know, something like because Frederick Douglass wasn't Booker T. Washington and Booker T. Washington wasn't, I don't know, uh, a Philip Randolph. Right. Or, exactly. Or even Walter White. For right. that matter. And they're all Obama. Right. 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 <laughs> right. Yeah. right. Totally. Totally. Uh, and I mean, the premise is that there is this that there's a supra historical black presence. It's almost like a communist party. Right. Except it's not an institution and it hovers over us all that sort of guides and directs everything. And this mindset, first of all, I mean, influenced at the very beginning of the field of study of black American political thought. It was already there. And that's partly because it grew up in sort of 
the moment of, of, of Cold War consensualism, ironically. But the idea was that, that, that there's a seamless, timeless, uh, I mean, Negro struggle. And that often enough was an oscillation between two poles, either protest or accommodation or moderation and a militance. And then eventually it became nationalism versus uh, I mean, integrationism. <clears throat> but it's a fundamentally ass backward and utterly useless way to try to make, make, make sense of any phenomena that exists within history. For 30 years, I could say that and just kind of be done with it. I think it's even more in, insidious now though, um, you know, because it's part of, when, when we think about this, um, you know, there's a sort of nominal black left politics, right? That sort of um, runs out of steam in like 1965, right? So like, like it, 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 it can't accommodate anything that's happened since the Voting Rights Act. Like it can't accommodate the emergence of a black political class. And it's always re reaching back to some, you know, to some shit that happened in slavery, basically, right? Or I mean, the equivalent, but certainly something prior to the defeat of the Jim Crow um, complex, right, like in the South. At past a certain point, you have to ask why, right? I mean, why is it that all of that, that the baseline of, of contemporary black political argument now hinges on analogy to the segregation era or to slavery? Mm -hmm. And I think in, increasingly it becomes clear, right, that the answer to that question ha has to, or is, that, that it's possible to pretend um, that that in those earlier periods, all black people shared a common interest. That it's much more uh, I mean difficult to sell if we look at the present on uh, on its own terms. So so that for instance, you know, just to shoot the fish in a barrel. Um, um, but Michelle Alexander, uh, you book the New Jim Crow, powerful idea. You read the book, and all the way through, she says it, it's it's. It's like Jim Crow, it's like Jim Crow, it's like Jim Crow, it's like, it's a, you know, like Jim Crow. And then we get to the point finally where the rubber has to meet the road and she says, well, actually it's not, right? No, it's not like it at all. Well, what then is the power of the analogy if even she has to admit that it doesn't work? And that means that, you know, from the standpoint of the historian of ideologies, which I was professionally for decades, you know, this is what prompts the question, smells like there's some bullshit ideology going on, right? And I mean, that's, and, and that's where we are. So that's why I think that the, uh, uh, and, and Toure, Ken, Warren, Willie Leggett, and, and a few others of us actually wrote a little piece together, a little statement uh, um, um, about this question in uh, Nonsite a few years ago. And, and um, part of the punchline is that the notion of a trans-historical singular black movement is fundamentally a reactionary one at this point. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.